like a recipe, right? You have to dial in all your settings and figure out which combinations work for what you're trying to achieve. And you just have to practice. You just keep practicing, practicing, practicing. Off Gassing, a scuba podcast with host Nick Hogel. It was an honor to welcome back Jamie Leslie Feldman to the podcast. Late last year, she participated in a roundtable discussion about photography. In this episode, I get a chance to catch up with her and hear more about her journey into the aquatic environment, her love of photography, some tips and tricks, capturing images of high profile, prominent creatures with the work she does as the underwater paparazzi and much more. Please enjoy. Jamie, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I am good. I uh, got my coffee going, uh, getting the morning started. So it's it's a good one. It's a good one. Well, welcome back. It's great to have you back. And I'm excited to have you back and hear more about your journey. Um, we had you on the round table of photographers. And um, how, how did you like that anyways? How, did you have a good time with that? I really did. It was really cool chatting with the other ladies and um, especially since we all were kind of on the same page on our viewpoint on the topic. And it was just fun to sit and chat about it. And we don't get to do that very often. So I really enjoyed it. And thank you for having me on that. Yeah, yeah, no, it was it was awesome. And I, I love being able to get people across different time zones just because it make there's a little bit of a challenge to it, but when it all comes together, it's it's just an absolutely fun thing. So I really appreciate you participating on it, and um, yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your journey. Like I was saying, and my first question I wanted to ask you is, tell me about how and why you got into scuba diving. Tell me about that first breath. What led to that moment? Was it love at first breath? Was it, I hate everything about this. I'm never doing it again. Tell me all about it. So I do not come from a water family. Everyone in my family pretty much thinks I'm nuts. Uh, so this whole downward spiral that has happened into the scuba world is, has baffled my entire family. Um, and how it happened was I was at a wedding in Hawaii with a bunch of friends and we had just made it into a vacation. And one of our friends said, Hey, there's this discover scuba diving thing. Will someone go with me? And I was like, that sounds cool. All right, I'll go check it out. And uh, we went and I got below the surface and took my first breath underwater and was like, "Uh Oh, <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> and I'm like looking around this blue water, there's turtles everywhere swimming around. I actually got in trouble with the instructor because I kept on wanting to swim with the turtles and I'm not a certified scuba diver at that point. It's just a discover scuba class. And she's like, no, no, no. She made me hold her hand the rest of the like DSD. <laughs> so got in trouble immediately, but that's okay. Totally worth it. Um, so I got back home and had to figure out what I needed to do to become a certified scuba diver. I, I was like, I have to do this. This was amazing. It was just a different feeling. I just didn't know anything like it. And I just wanted to see more. So I eventually went to go do my open water. Typically I try to drag one of my friends along with it and no one would do it with me. So I was like, fine, I will go by myself. I will figure this out. Turns out starting out as an open water student, I was every instructor's worst nightmare. I was just a hot mess in the pool. I was underweighted. And so instead of like a logical person of being like, maybe I should stop and put more weight in my VCD. I was like, no, I'm going to flail up the surface and try to get down. Also, the mass clearing skill was horrible. Like, I think my instructor just handed me off to the dive master. It was just like, I can't deal with you anymore. <laughs> just a hot mess. <laughs> so I managed to get through the class with the help of the dive master, but I was still very uncomfortable. So I kept taking classes to get comfortable. Um, I wasn't comfortable enough to join the clubs or try to do anything on my own. Um, so I figured if I kept taking classes, I'll get you know, more practice in and meet people who will have the same type of viewpoints I do with diving and see where it goes from there. And so it, it definitely took me a while. I, that's actually how I ended up becoming a dive master is because I just kept taking classes. I just wanted to know more. I never wanted to be that damsel in distress. So I was like, if I just know everything, then it'll make me feel more comfortable being out there and not reliant on somebody else. I mean, obviously, buddy system, totally support that. But I also want to make sure that I can save myself. 
that made me a lot more confident. And here we are today, <laughs> where it's been <laughs> years, 15, 16 years later, and it's like an obsession and I love it. And <laughs> Where was home? Is this all in San Diego? The Discover Scuba was in Maui, Hawaii, but I lived in San Diego at the time. So I came, I went, decided to go from warm water to cold water to get certified. Probably not the <laughs> rightest thing to do, but I was determined to do it. Like I wanted to breathe underwater so badly. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. Was there, because I've actually never been diving in Hawaii or San Diego, because I've actually, I've heard that the waters in Hawaii can be somewhat cold too. And then I've also heard the same thing about San Diego. Are they similar or, or is there a big difference in the two? There is a big difference. I mean, I can go maybe at a three to five mil in Hawaii, and I am a straight up wussy dry suit diver here in San Diego. Like, I don't dive in anything else. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what the water temps were in Hawaii, but they were comfortable. I mean, you could go out in your swimsuit in the water if you were just swimming. But here, I mean, our bottom temps typically are between the low to upper 50s. Um, on like the average. I mean, it can get higher than that, lower than that, but that's the average. That's kind of a shock when you're going from Hawaii to San Diego. (laughs) So when you did that, it didn't obviously didn't deter you the cold water. You were just like, I'm I'm still doing this because I know for, for some people, they're like never doing cold water or as soon as they do it, they're like, yeah, this is not it. It wasn't, I saw it as a minor speed bump to like get comfortable, but I never forgot that feeling I had when I had went below the surface during that DSD and taking my first breaths underwater and seeing that first turtle, I just never forgot it. And I was like, I am going to get that back and I am going to push through this until I get there. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. So uh, before I, I asked the question, you were about to go into the photography aspect of it can you talk about that journey so photography is that did you do that on dry land before you incorporated it into the underwater world yes Um, i had been obsessed with photography since i was about 11. it wasn't something that i just did from birth but pretty close Um, my mom had thrown me into a black and white dark room class when i was in middle school and she was just like this looks interesting you should try it and i was like all right, whatever. I'm 11. And it, I was obsessed, like immediately. Like, the dark room, the developing negatives, um, just going out and shooting and finding contrast. It was really just so much fun. And I loved photography ever since, just taking pictures of whatever I could topside. So I, it was a while before I brought a camera down with me because, like I said, I was a hot mess diver. So I needed some experience, um, needed some comfort, needed to make sure that I wasn't going to be bouncing off the ground with the camera. I wanted to make sure my buoyancy was in check. Um, so I want to say it was probably a good like 40 or 50 dives later until I finally brought a camera down. Like I wanted to just concentrate on what I was doing first, which is something I tell people all the time. I know everyone's excited to get their cameras in the water, but I was like, hey, we're in another world. You need to make sure that everything else is dialed in before you bring a camera as a part of that. But yeah, so after that, I got point and shoot and dropped down and started playing with it. And then as most photographers know, with any type of photography equipment, it's also a downward spiral and you just need to get the next thing and the next thing. And then you need the strobe and then you need the video light and then you need the GoPro on top. And then, oh, wait, I need to upgrade the whole system. So yeah, <laughs> still obsessed. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely a uh, a not even a journey. I was gonna say just a I don't want to call it a money pit. Um, like I, but photography in general, because I do a little bit of land photography, just like amateur. It's a total hobby, nothing professional. Um, but I really, really do enjoy it. But once I started getting into it, I'm like, man, this is this is not a uh, cheap thing. So I went on this like kind of solo backpacking trip in. Southeast Asia, when I went back to Texas, um, I started working at this job and this guy that was working there part time, he was actually a professional photographer. And, um, you know, I would tell him about my travels and like, yeah, this is what I like to do. And he was the one that kind of convinced me. He was like, hey, you should get into photography. Like, why not? You know, he probably had ulterior motives because at the end of the day, he's like, oh, well, it so happens that I'm selling my camera, you know, so you should buy it. And I was looking at it and 
it was way more than I needed. I mean, I could have started with something a lot less than what he at the time. Uh, and I actually still have the camera. It's a A7R2, uh, Sony A7R2. And at the time, I was really looking into it. And it was a I mean, it's still a really nice camera. But when I bought it at the time, it was still kind of like a higher end model. And a lot of people were like, man, that's way more camera than you need. Like you do not need a camera like that. But I've always been under the impression going into things. And, and he was telling me the same thing, too. He's like, it's nice to have a camera that you can grow with and really learn the camera. And it's not going to limit your abilities. So two, three years down the line, you're going to have to buy another camera. You know, but, you know, with technology these days, usually two or three years down the line, you're usually buying another camera just because. But no, I really, really enjoyed it. So just curious, what do you so what did you start shooting on? And then what do you shoot on now? I started with a Canon power shot, like one of those little dinky, tiny square cameras and just a little plastic housing. I just already had the camera. So I was like, I'm just get a little casing for it and start practicing and seeing how I felt about it. Cause it was small as something I could deal with, especially since I was still feeling like I was learning and growing. After that, I got a sea life from the sea life series. I think it was like the DC 1200 or something at the time. And it was just a nice, great little compact thing. I could do wide. I could do macro with it. It had strobes and a video light. And I think I upgraded that once to the DC 1400. And I used that one actually for a long time. I, I feel like I'd use that one probably like a good four or five years um, just because I was content with it. And the only reason why I kind of moved away from it was because I started getting that itch for more control. It's like I wanted to have options with my settings and changing the aperture and the shutter and kind of getting different effects. I felt like I was kind of hitting a wall. So, I mean, it was a great camera to start out with. Um, and I did a lot with it in those years. And then from there, I upgraded to um, a low-end DSLR model, which was a Canon T3i, which I actually still have and probably should sell at some point, <laughs> um, if it's even worth anything, I don't know. And then uh, that one I shot for quite a few years. And then I probably should have went full frame, but I upgraded to the Canon 80D instead. So it's like, it wasn't quite ready to do the full full frame format with how much that costs underwater. <laughs> it was a little scary. Um, and now I actually really love my ADD. Like I'm going to shoot it until it dies. <laughs> I can do a 60 millimeter macro lens on it, which is really versatile for the waters in San Diego with macro and for a wide angle when I'm doing all my kelp shots and stuff, especially if we're out in Point Loma or the Channel Islands, um, I have a, a Tokina 10 to 17 fisheye. Um, so that can really get like some cool dynamic shots, either close focus, wide angle, or just, you know, really trying to frame up kelp and things along that nature. But it's a great lens and I love it. So I'm like, I'm not changing <laughs> until I things die. <laughs> that's, uh, that's awesome. Um, so oh, I have so many questions just because I it, underwater photography is like something I I go back and forth on like I really really want to get into it but at the same time i'm just like man it's it's really i just see once photographers get into it or or underwater photographers i should say i mean it really does become their whole diving right i interviewed somebody at one point and they were just like i when i dive i dive with a camera like it's never not a part of my diving and would you say that most of your dot like do you feel weird when you dive without a camera or does it even happen these days I don't dive without a camera. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds horrible to say, but I have this phobia that the day I don't bring my camera is the day that whale is going to swim over my head. <laughs> so I always have at least a GoPro on me. <laughs> Take me through, because there obviously is a little bit of prep work to go into the underwater world with the full housing because that's the kind of the thing that maybe makes me a little bit nervous sometimes is I know that when you start to get into it it's like okay I need to prep the underwater housing because you don't want to get in there and flood it obviously so take me through like 
you're about to go dive. What is all the prep work that you need to do to bring the camera into the underwater world? I start with fresh batteries on everything. Like everything is a fresh battery. So the last thing I want to happen is for me to get down there and something dies because I was lazy and decided not to change out the batteries. Um, so the strobes, the camera, uh, the GoPro all have freshly charged batteries in it before each um, new dive. Well, I would, not each new dive, but like each new session. Like if I'm going out for a three tank dive, um, it'll probably be the same batteries the whole dive. But that morning when I put my stuff together, they are all fresh batteries. I think that was first and foremost because that has been a mistake in the past. An immediate check for memory card is another one. And um, also making sure that lens cap is off. I've also made that mistake before. <laughs> and then it's kind of a just very therapeutic session with a, I have a specialty like lamp that kind of like goes over my entire desk where I sit there um, with also a headlamp and I take the O-rings out and I clean all the grooves and then I will uh, wipe down all the O-rings to make sure it doesn't have any debris on it, put like a little bit of grease on it, fit it back in, make sure everything looks okay before I put the housing back back on and the same thing with the caps on the strobes like they came off the the o-rings come off you clean them make sure the groups are clean put that all back together and then the most important thing that i tell everybody to do that i have been very guilty of uh not doing and regretted it is taking test shots as soon as you get everything together you turn the camera on you turn the strobes on you make sure everything fires because i have done all the things you are not supposed to do and it would have been caught if I did that test shot, but I have forgotten a memory card and I have left the lens cap on and I have forgot to attach the little cord in there that makes actually, actually makes your strobes fire. <laughs> no. All would be alleviated if you always take a test shot after you put your entire camera set up together. But yes, actually just recently, it was just this last fall, I was out with my friends at the Coronado Islands to shoot the sea lion puppies. And I was like one of the first ones in. I was pumped. I was excited. I was like, let me just go roll around with these little puppies. They're so much fun. And then just about everyone's in the water and I'm swimming back to the boat. And one of my friends is looking at me like, what's wrong? And I pointed to the camera and I was like, no. And he's like, oh, well, let me see. And I can fix it. I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> I knew exactly what happened. <laughs> I was trying to fire underwater and the camera was firing and the flashes were not. I was like, I did not hook up the hot shoe flash to make the strobes work. And so I had to climb back onto the boat, dry off as much as I could. The dive master helped me to open up the whole thing so I could plug in the hot shoe mount to make my strobes work. So don't be like Jamie and just take a test shot. <laughs> when you are on a trip, is that something that's done like you're doing like a like a, a multiple day trip, multiple dives a day trip. You have to do that every single time, clean the O-rings, or is it something that you can go like a few days without doing, or is it something religiously that you do every before every dive? It's something I religiously do before every dive. I just feel like it would be to protect my equipment. I think it's good practice just to make sure to eyeball it, keep it clean, do a little, make sure it has a nice thin layer of grease on it. It just, it protects your investment. And I just think it's smart to do. So when you were getting into this, were you taught this or was it something that you kind of figured out on your own? Like the, the cleaning the O-rings and having to take it apart every time? My first big camera setup, I think I just read every single instruction manual, like front and back. <laughs> so I might be a little more obsessive about it. But there's a lot of great resources online, especially when you're first starting out with like even specific types of cameras on what you should be doing. And there's a lot of the a lot of the photographers, even the ladies that we were talking with last time, like if, if someone reaches out to me and asks me questions in those regards, I answer them. And most of the people in our community do, which is why I love the diving community so much, is that people are generally pretty supportive. And so that's also a good resource as well. So yeah, my next question, tell me a little bit more about how underwater paparazzi came to be. That was completely random. Uh, we were heading out for a night dive one night and uh, we had a, a thread going of some people that were wanting to join up with us. And I think on one of the messages, I was like, hey, don't worry, the underwater paparazzi will be there as a joke. And I stopped and I was like, oh, I wonder if that's available. 
and went and looked up the domain name and was like, okay, everything was free. So I registered it all and the rest is history. No, I love I love how uh, ideas just come out like that, just like a random thing. So what what kind of stuff are you doing with underwater paparazzi? Like, are you is it just all fun? I'm sure there's some professional work in there. What tell me a little bit more about the the underwater paparazzi. It's primarily for fun for me. It's kind of my nerdy outlet in life to be able to express myself and share with anyone who wants to listen the amazing things that I see underwater because I think such a small fraction of the world gets to see that kind of stuff. So I think it's really neat to share, especially when we get cool phenomenons here in San Diego. It's really neat. Um, And I kind of like to be that resource for people, especially um, cold water divers who like to come to San Diego to dive and they want to hear about this stuff and see if they need to jump down to San Diego real quick. A lot of those people know that they can contact me and that if there is anything weird going on, I'm probably going to be in it. So (laughs) I like being that resource. I like doing stuff that helps other organizations. And I've worked with um, a handful of organizations donating photographs and um, helping with their cause, whether it be to raise money or educate the public kids programs, things like that, I'm happy to help with. And then I have done gallery showings. I have sold stuff before, but none of it is a a full-time thing. I I do want to keep it like hobby-ish because I want to continue to love it. I don't want to depend on it. Um, And that was really important to me. So it it is not my day job, but it is my obsession. (laughs) No, that's awesome. That's awesome. So I remember when we were chatting on the round table I had asked the question about, you know, they, there's the joke that, you know, if you're going diving with a photographer, you're pretty much solo diving. And you were telling me that you actually went and took to, you got like a, a a solo certification or self-reliance certification. Was it because of the photography or was it just because you wanted to learn more to learn to be a a safer diver for yourself? I wanted to learn to be a safer diver for myself. I didn't have really aspirations to be a solo diver, but my husband and I had a trip coming up where we were going to be on a boat where he was going to be with friends spearfishing and I was going to be paired up with someone I didn't know as a dive buddy. And since I don't know that person, I want to know that if they decide to just ditch me, that I can save myself. And that's why I felt that class was really fun and really important to do, just to know that I can be safe on my own and to be able to run those drills underwater as if I was diving alone. I just thought it was really nice to know. And it made me more confident in a lot okay. of different right So the buddy that I was paired up with on that trip turned out to be fine. So everything was fine. <laughs> So I will be honest, I have not taken a solo or, or self-reliant course. Um, I Back in Texas, I've done quite a bit of, of solo diving. And looking back on it, I'm just like, oh, yeah, I probably should have taken one. And it is a course that I'll probably end up taking at some point in time. But yeah, I, I actually have not. So and, and random question, have you ever actually taken a, a like underwater photography class or is, are you all self-taught? I'm self-taught and obsessively reading a lot of things on the internet. (laughs) Do you have a go-to source? Like what's your, what's your biggest source of information that you'll go to like a a public magazine publication or website or manuals? Um, There was a photo video guide out there. I think it was from, I, I don't remember what the website was off the top of my head. I could probably look it up for you later, but it was a big, huge blog just on just about everything that you could think of. And then um, Backscatter has a blog that has a lot of information on it, but also just YouTube channels would walk you through it. And then you could physically see what they were doing as well. I know that Brent Duran also does a series on YouTube where he talks about a lot of basics and strobe settings and camera settings in general. That's very informative from either his DSLR setup down to like the GoPro type of setup. And I think he also uses a, a phone too with sea life they have like a phone case thingy so i had watched some of his videos um so there's a lot of people that do a lot of cool stuff online and then also just like hanging out with other people like i don't ever want to be that person that's constantly like hey what's your settings but i want to be the person on why 
Like, that's really cool. Like, how did you set that up? What were you thinking behind it? Because it's more, photography is more than just like, what are your settings? Because everything can change. Settings don't, it's, it's hard to tell somebody that because your environment underwater is always going to be different depending on time of day, depending on conditions, depending on how up or down you are in the water column. Because obviously it gets darker the deeper you go. You could be in the exact same spot, the exact same two days, and one day be sunny, one day be cloudy, and you're talking about totally different settings. So it just, I like to know the why, and I love talking to people that want to talk to me about that. <laughs> what What is your ideal, not camera settings, but environmental settings? Like, what do you like to shoot? Like the 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 dark kind of tones, the light tones. What is your like ideal go to, or do you just like it all? If I can be underwater, I like it all. <laughs> I just want to be underwater. <laughs> I don't know. Let's just say I, we have people that'll complain about our local conditions being like, oh, it's only like eight to 10 feet. And I'm like, hey, I only need like three feet to take a macro shot. I'm cool. Let's go. <laughs> as long as the waves aren't going to knock me down, I'm down. Let's go. <laughs> what are some challenges? So I've... I, in 2022, I actually, um, so I bought a new camera with my new camera. I ended up getting a new lens and, uh, macro photography was something that I've kind of wanted to dive into. Like I said, I have not done anything underwater, but there was times where I was kind of finding it a little challenging to do the macro. What are some, some tips you have for macro photography? Cause obviously it's very different. I would assume than, you know, like a wide angle shot. So what are some challenges that you see and or that you that you've encountered and then how to like overcome those type of challenges? With macro, if for like some really good shots, sometimes you have to be pretty close and animals can be skittish and they don't want to be that close to you. So that can be a challenge right off the bat. I know some people like the in the DSL world, like I think it's a 105 for Nikon or the 100 millimeter for uh, Canon because it gives them a little bit more working room between the end of the lens and their subject. But I really love my 60 millimeter because I can get more than just the tiny creatures. I can get an octopus that's like a little bit bigger or a crab or something a little bit more, or maybe use a, a diopter. But uh, macro can be challenging because of that. Like you can't get things to cooperate. You have to kind of like figure out what maybe your settings want to be. Because the other thing is too, is you're close enough that even if they stay still for you, the flash of your strobes are going to be like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> and they'll take off. So that that's probably a pretty big challenge. One that I see is sometimes people aren't, com again, comfortable enough with their buoyancy underwater to be doing macro because macro is so small, so tiny on the bottom that you need to be, be a really good buoyancy or you are going to silt it out and probably annoy everybody around you. Our grounds in La Jolla can be very, very dirty, silty, whatever. And you could just even like a one finger touch on the bottom could do a like poof and everything's gone. So that can also be a challenge based on your settings too. Is it just if you don't have your buoyancy control, you're never going to get your macro shot because it's always going to be full of particulate. Yeah. So I got, I think it's a, um, I think it's a 90 millimeter lens. I'd have to double check. It's a 90 millimeter lens with a macro setting on it. So I just went to the park because I'd never shot macro before. And um, so I was trying to get like caterpillars and ants, just things moving. And that was the the challenge that I was finding. I'm, I'm sure it's the same in the underwater world is things are moving and to try to like follow it. I guess this is just a challenge in photography in general to try to follow it so you can capture a good shot because, you know, I'll, I'll end up looking at it and then I'm like, oh, the, the, the head is completely out of focus or, you know, like I have I wasn't able to kind of capture what I wanted to capture. Is that just something that you get better with over time? Yeah, and you'll start learning how you can um, alter your settings too so that you get a deeper uh, depth of field, have more in focus so that you don't think that, oh my God, I got space in focus and you really just got his little antennas in focus and that's it. It's always a fun thing to discover later on. But yeah, it's just comfort level. I always tell people macro can be easier too, especially if you just find something that's still and that doesn't move. Um, just to practice and to keep your camera in the same setting and just keep on shifting um, your aperture or your shutter, whatever you want to focus on, so that you can see how those um, settings actually work on your image. And you can keep changing, changing, changing. And when you look at it in your computer later, you can see the progression and be like, oh, I see, I can see 
what that does. I mean, you obviously will have to compensate with something else to make sure it's exposed. But if you just focus on aperture and keep turning it so that you can see what the depth of field does, but like focus on a rock or a leaf or something like that, that doesn't move. I think that'll give you a better idea of where your sweet spot settings are on your camera as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's something it's so like I'm bad. And that's why I tell people it's just, it's just a hobby because I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the camera. And like I said, this is all dry photography. Um, I'll pick up the camera and I'll, and I'll maybe go like a week where I'm like really getting into it. And then there'll be like a couple of weeks where I'm not. And I'm like, man, I really need to get back to the camera. So is it easy for you to stay motivated? I'm sure just every time you're going on a dive, you're just like cameras coming with me. Do you ever hit like lulls or is it just completely excited every time you have the camera in hand? I am excited every time I have the camera in hand. And like I previously said, I don't dive without one. I just can't. It just is not in my blood. <laughs> so, um, but I do hit points where I have these creative blocks where I just don't feel like things are kind of turning out the way I want. And so what I've done in the past, which is going to sound a little funny to some people, um, but and while I'll still bring the GoPro when I do this, because, you know, that whale one of these days is going to swim over my head. Um, I will actually take my old, I have an old uh, Nikonos 3, which is a film camera. And what I'll do is I'll take my video lights and take out that film camera and limit myself to 36 exposures and make myself sit and think about it and really think about settings. And granted, only a handful ever turn out anyway, but it's kind of fun. And seeing film underwater is actually beautiful, but it also takes patience. But since it kind of puts you in a different mindset, sometimes that helps me just kind of reset and um, start thinking creatively again with my digital setup. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, actually, I have heard of people doing that, that they'll go and they like to shoot film for that very reason, just because you only get because me, I'm, I mean, the, the first time I started with the my camera when I first got it, it was just like the the trigger was on triggers down, I'm just shooting everything, right? So and then you come back and you upload it on your computer and you're like, I have 400 images of like the same thing. So I'm like, I need to get a little bit better about doing this. <laughs> so it's, I, I've been trying to do that where I'm like, okay, I'm only going to take a certain amount of photos. When you go on an average shoot, how many pictures are you coming back with? So if it's just La Jolla, I mean, if it's an average dive, it might be like a hundred pictures or maybe even less than that, depending. Or if it's the Coronados with crazy sea puppies, it might be like 700. <laughs> <laughs> it just depends. Um, but that's the beauty of DSLRs is that like, if you are fortunate enough to be able to do that, you, you do have the ease of not being limited to 36 shots and you can keep doing things over and over again. And I think it would help you be a better photographer faster because you can see your mistakes faster than you can when, by developing a roll of film. On the side note, if it makes you feel better, my husband calls me a photo hoarder because of how many pictures that I take. And I have such a hard time deleting the ones that are all just like a little bit off. Like, oh, I think it's just looking a little bit to the right, but do I need that one? And he's just rolling his eyes at me. <laughs> I, uh, that's funny. No, I, I can kind of relate because I have a hard time deleting like almost any photo to where I'm like, ah, maybe when I get better at editing, I can come back and do something with this photo. Cause that, that's another thing that I'm still kind of working with or, or, uh, it's a challenge, I guess I should say is it, it took me a while to find, I don't want to say my voice or my method of editing because, you know, when I first got into photo or not Photoshop, I use, I use Lightroom. But when I first got into Lightroom, because it, it was so funny because when I got in, my buddy sold me the camera. I knew nothing about photography, absolutely nothing other than like I can take a picture on my phone. And, you know, he was telling me he's like, there's probably... I think he even said he's like, there's no image that goes on the internet or that's published that isn't edited. Everything is edited. You need to bring it and you need to edit it. And so that was quite a bit of a challenge for me because I think, you know, at first it was like, okay, this like just heavy on the saturation, this and that, you know, I'm just like really editing the crap out of it. And then I'm just like, I don't, I don't really like this at all. 
<laughs> to the point where I, I still am trying to find my method of editing. But um, what what is your what are some tips or some editing advice that you have? First and foremost, Lightroom is a beast. I absolutely love it, but it is a scary beast for anyone start starting out. And they everyone should just know that, but know that it's very easily learnable. But I learned Lightshot or Lightshot, <laughs> Lightroom, Photoshop, you know. What I, mean. <laughs> I learned Lightroom from watching videos again off of YouTube. So it, it's I feel that if you are willing to take those steps to learn Lightroom, is such a powerful tool. And then with I, I would always start by looking at basics for underwater editing just on YouTube. There's so many different videos on it. You can kind of see what people do and you can kind of develop your style after that. But I mean, typically, if you are at least getting the, the photo somewhat correct um, exposure wise in your camera, there should be pretty minimal that you need to do. Maybe adjust the contrast a little bit. Maybe the there's like a dehaze slider that can kind of help deepen some of those dark colors. And then maybe mess with a little bit with the lights and darks if you need to bring the highlights down or like the shadows up just a smidge. Um, those are just some of the basics that I run through. And there's like only a handful that I might go and do some serious editing if I like see some like major potential with. But just some of the basics in Lightroom should suffice most of the time. But yeah, definitely check YouTube for videos. You can even Google like specifically what you want to do. And I'm sure you'll find a video on something that someone has done. And then so I know with a lot of photographers, I mean, I feel like video and photography are kind of hand in hand these days. Do you find yourself leaning more towards one or is it just like, do you like video? How tell me about like the video side of it? I love photos more. And I think it's just because it's what I've grown up with. Um, but I'm starting to have like this love for video. I started doing it because I kind of felt pressure to with um, being on social media and stuff like that. But I've actually kind of grown to enjoy it because you do get a kind of a sense of being there with video. And you can also do some pretty silly things with video, which is what I really enjoy to do is try to make people laugh with some of my stupid reels. And that's what I like. So I'm starting to like video more and more. So that would be a reason why I might actually upgrade my camera system is to get a setup like a mirror. My, I have an R5 um, and I've contemplated for a while trying to put it underwater. But like I said, I do love my ADD so much. But having a system that I could shoot underwater video with a little bit better than just, you know, straight GoPro that I can't really touch the settings very well. I um, mean, the GoPro is great. Like I've gotten a lot of great stuff with the GoPro, but um, that would be the one thing like that I'm kind of, it's in the back of my head. Maybe I will upgrade. I do have that R5, maybe. <laughs> well, actually I was, I was gonna, well, I, uh, I have a few different questions, but well, I guess my, my, my take on video is I'm, you know, I, I don't put as much time into the photography as I feel like I could, or I should, so I'm still, to me, I'm still just like, it's all a big learning curve. Cause I'll, like I said, I'll give it, you know, sometimes I'll really fall into it. And this week I'm watching videos and then I'm like, okay, I'm going out and applying these things that I learned from the videos that I'm watching. And even with this podcast, um, I was like, I need to start doing video. Cause I don't do any video. Like I, I tell people all the time, like I just use the audio. I don't use the video kind of the same thing that you were saying with being on social media, like I feel like you need video, like video needs to be there. So I started trying to do reels, you know, I'm like, okay, I need to start putting some reels out. And I feel like I'm just I'll hit a point where I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> like, like I think my, my first couple reels that I put out, I think it probably took me like two hours just to get it because I'm like, uh, am I like, I, have, I feel like I have big hands and just trying to do it on the phone. And then I'm like, okay, I need to get a video editing tool. So I went and got, uh, what is it? Da Vinci, Da Vinci, um, the, the free, the free one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And someone's like, oh, you know, you don't need Da Vinci. You need to use uh cap cut. I think cap cuts another one. And, and there's just all these different programs and I'm just like, okay, this is overwhelming. Let me just stick to editing the audio. Like I don't want to put together video. But I, I, I want to try to move more into that this year. So, but yeah, that's, that's my whole, my whole tangent on video. So, and then I was going to ask, you have the R5. So do you still do quite a bit of land photography or is it more underwater photography? I still do underwater photography more. And honestly, the only reason why you don't see more from me is probably because it's conditions related. <laughs> um, it's keeping me out of the water. <laughs> 
Um, but I like shooting topside. I like doing nighttime photography. Um, we're coming across a time right now in San Diego where our harbor seals are going to be giving birth and they do it on the beaches where you can stand on the above walls and watch. And I have actually watched multiple births, like actual harbor seal births on the beach. It's actually pretty cool. And to shoot that and video that is pretty neat. Um, we also have all the sea lions here. Um, so many species of birds. Bird nerds would love it here. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things, but primarily my favorite thing to take pictures of on land is a very active three-year-old who runs around. So that's what I have used my R5 the most for is chasing around my son. <laughs> he is also going to kill me when he's 16 with the amount of ridiculous outfits I have made him put on. That was my COVID project. <laughs> With with me when I when I first got the camera, I think it was the cat. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna try to do the cat. Lot lots of cat. I mean, if you look through my phone, there's tons of cat photos anyway. So and actually, <laughs> so I put up one reel on on my Instagram. Um, and it was like a few maybe like a month ago or something. And I was trying to think. I'm like, okay, how can I how can I get views? What what can I do to, to drive traffic? And I'm like, okay, what's the What's the number one most watched videos on the internet? Cats, right? <laughs> so I, was like, I was like, I need, a, I need to incorporate my cats into my my scuba videos. <laughs> so I was like, just trying to place, yeah, trying. It's funny because with cats, you can really get a lot of good photos, but when you're trying to do something with them like when you actually like putting thought of like okay i'm gonna do this then it becomes just absolutely like what am i doing <laughs> it's always better with random ones so. yes. oh i did have a thought when you were talking about your reels and especially i know reels yes. and stuff and video and photographers is a very scary realm to go by a lot of people are rebelling because they're like i'm not a videographer i'm a photographer uh, you can't make me do videos, but you can actually hack that and you can hack it in a way where you can display your photography and not have to like feel like a video creating genius either. And all you do is when you're in your Lightroom, you can crop in your Lightroom in the crop setting to the nine by 16 or the nine, what is it? Nine to 16 ratio, which is what reels is. So you can actually already pre-crop your photo that way. So it's in the size and then go to your Instagram or TikTok or whatever you're using. And they all have templates now. If you find a photo template and you go use template, you can load up all your videos and it'll put it all in there to the beat and then you're done. <laughs> and you don't have to actually curate anything. <laughs> you can even just do that on your phone. You find a song that you like and um, just take your photos and put it to the beat of the song and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, uh, I will definitely have to um look in well i i have i do know the templates because i think when i first started uh so i have like my personal account and i was like okay i need to put some reels out and and then i saw the templates i'm like oh okay this is kind of easy but then there'll be something that i'm just like oh, i want that one to be a little bit longer or or you know i just wanted too much control over it and yeah it's uh it's it's a funny thing but no i really i i do and, and it is fun though i do enjoy it, it just Kind of like you were saying with Lightroom, though, it is a powerful tool and it can get overwhelming very quickly. Like I still don't know. I probably use Lightroom to 25% of its capacity. And then like I'll see these new videos coming out like we just added these more tools and, and it's, you know, you could get really good with your editing. And I'm just like, I don't even know how to use like I could, pro I'd probably be fine with the the ten year ago version, you know, just because like it's like a slow build up. So, but so any any big trips coming up? Any big, yeah, I guess trips coming up. I do have one major one coming up this year that I'm very excited for. Um, and this fall, uh, me and my friends are headed to Northern Vancouver Island. We are going to God's Pocket for a week. So we are going to do some extreme cold water, British Columbia diving, and it is so beautiful up there. And I'm so excited to go. Um, so I'm super pumped about that. And I also have my sprinkling of dive boats, either locally or to the Channel Islands throughout the year as well. So I have those in the books, along with hopefully a lot of shore diving and some other stuff slammed in there, if I can fit it in as well. <laughs> but the God's Pocket one's a big one. I'm very excited. Okay, okay. Yeah, I actually have heard of 
God's pocket. Uh, the the one photographer he came up in that diving in that area, uh, the North Pacific Northwest. And tell me, tell me a little bit about why that's such a big destination. Everything is just huge there. I, I don't know what it is. It's just it looks like another. I mean, obviously, underworld, uh, underwater is another world, but something about the Pacific Northwest is just magical. It's just like their anemones are huge and. I saw my first giant Pacific octopus last year when I went to the Hood Canal, and that was just incredible to see. And um, they have these big um, white tree plume anemones that make you look like you're in a little fantasy world all by itself. But it's just the creatures in the Pacific Northwest and the diversity is just so different from here, but kind of, I don't know, it's different, but the same. It's like a lot that's in San Diego, but bigger. <laughs> And there's a lot about like even just driving the coast up of Vancouver Island just to get up to Port Hardy to God's Pocket is just like otherworldly to me. It is just something out of a storybook. And even though it is cold, <laughs> it is so cold, it is 100% worth it. Because I think I was expecting when we went a couple of years ago that it was going to be like 42 degrees. And it turned out to be like, I was stoked that it was like 45. I remember I had accidentally flooded my dry glove. And so my hand was freezing on the dive, but I had this mentality in my head of like, how often am I going to be here? I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to do the dive. And I think I got to 45 minutes and I was going to go to my buddy and be like, all right, I'm done. I need to, I, I'm, I can't feel my hand anymore. And like, right as I was about to tell her, I had a free swimming juvenile wolf eel come out in front of me. And I'm like, never mind. I'm fine. I'm cool. I'm going to go play with this for a while. <laughs> but stuff like that, we don't see here. And it's just so amazing. No, that's awesome. I, um, that's actually a goal and, and I hope I can do it this year, but the, the Pacific Northwest is a goal that I've, I've wanted to go diving there for a long time since I've started diving. Cause you just hear about, you know, the seals and, and the giant octopus and just the really cool stuff that you can see there. And then the more that I talk to people that have been there or dive there, they tell me it's absolutely amazing. Cause I actually used to live uh, I don't know if you're super familiar with the area, but I don't know if you know uh, the San Juan Islands, Orcas Island, yeah. but I used to live oh, there yeah. when I was like 19, 19, 20, and I've always, always had a goal to go back. Uh, we actually went to um, the last time I was in Seattle. It was it was a fun trip. It was it was a little bit it was it was one for the books, I should say, but we took the um for my uh, girlfriend's birthday, we flew from Texas into Los Angeles, and then we took. There's a train that goes from Los Angeles all the way up the coast to Seattle, and we were supposed to take the train ride the whole way up. And you know, we got to the train, but it was in the middle of February, and we didn't make it out of California. And the whole train ride was supposed to be 36 hours from LA to Seattle. We were on the train for 38 hours, but we never left California. Oh, my gosh. Because, um, yeah, as soon as we got up to, like, I think it was, like, the Redding area, just massive snowfall. Trees are falling down on the tracks. And then we actually had to back down all the way to Sacramento. And then I have a lot of family in that area. And I, I felt, like, horrible because I wasn't telling family that I was coming through just because, like, oh, you need to stop. You need to stop. And I'm like, oh, I can't stop. We're just on a train. And then I had to call my cousin at like 2 a.m. in the morning. Like, hey, can I go stay here? <laughs> Surprise. Uh, but hey, what's family for? Yeah, what's family for, right? <laughs> um, but uh, so and then we ended up flying to Seattle because it was her birthday and, and spending a few days in Seattle. But I, I keep telling myself, like, I really, really want to come back to Seattle and just do some diving in that area. Last question for you. Somebody is getting into diving and they're a photographer, kind of like you, a photographer land side, they're getting into diving. What advice would you have for that person that wants to get into the underwater photography world? My first advice is to make sure that you're comfortable underwater first. I know us photographers are just obsessive and we want to bring that camera down immediately, but safety is first and foremost the most important thing. So to make sure that you are comfortable underwater, you are weighted correctly, that your buoyancy is okay, that your fins are not hitting the ground. And when you are doing multiple dives that way, where you know your trim is good, that point is a good time to be like, okay, I can start bringing a camera down 
and and start going from there. And then from then, it's just practice, practice, practice. Like I would say, it's very rare for someone to walk into the water and be have an amazing photographer right off the bat. Because even coming from a topside photographer, a lot of the rules change for underwater. So it's something to get used to and have a different eye for. And it's not to get frustrated and just to enjoy the process, doing the settings and lining your shots up underwater. It's like a recipe, right? You have to dial in all your settings and figure out which combinations work for what you're trying to achieve. And you just have to practice. You just keep practicing, practicing, practicing. And the other piece of advice would be is if you think you're close enough, you're not and get closer. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Jamie, I really, really want to thank you for coming back onto the podcast. It was absolutely wonderful to hear more about your journey. And um, I look forward to all the content that you're putting out there uh, that you will be putting out. And hopefully we could get in the water and do some diving. I'll have to come to, to San Diego and do some cold for me diving, um, even though I'm sure it's not as cold as a lot of other places. But... <laughs> But thank you very much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this. And absolutely, if you're in San Diego, let me know. We'll take you diving. Um, And I promise not to traumatize you with the cold or my obsessive photography-ness. Off-gassing, a scuba podcast.